Our next session will be on seizure assistance dogs, and we have three panelists who are sharing their own family's experiences. Our first parent panelist is Erin, who is the newest member to our DSF team and serves as our family network support group liaison. Erin and her husband, Leo, reside just outside of Seattle, Washington, and are parents to Eloise and Lionel, who has Gervais syndrome. In October 2019, the Rioyo family welcomed the newest member to their family, Alicia, a Golden Doodle service dog from Four Paws for Ability in Ohio. Our next panelist is Bethany Gehring. Bethany lives just outside of Philadelphia with her husband, Brad. They have twin 13-year-old daughters, Kylan and Taylor, and a 12-year-old son, Caleb. Currently, Bethany works as an inpatient nurse at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She and her family have been very involved with the local Epilepsy Foundation and the Gervais Syndrome Foundation, and they've also formed the Kylan Gehring Foundation, which focuses on local epilepsy advocacy and helping out other epilepsy-diagnosed families. Kylan, who has Gervais Syndrome, had her first seizure of many while on a family vacation at four months of age in 2008. In 2009, one week before Caleb was born, Kai's family received her genetic results that she had an SCN1A mutation. In 2014, she received her service dog, London Rose, from Four Paws for Ability. London will be retiring in the next two years, and the Gehring family is beginning to work on preparing for their next service dog, tentatively expected in 2020, 2023. And our last panelist is Morgan Turpin. Morgan is a full-time clinical laboratory scientist with a focus in molecular genetics. She has served as a parent ambassador for the Gervais Syndrome Foundation since 2019. She's an advocate within the Gervais community and has given multiple talks to spread awareness for Gervais syndrome, epilepsy, and the utility of seizure alert service dogs. Morgan resides in San Diego with her husband and two children. Her oldest son, Shane, is nine years old and was diagnosed with Gervais syndrome at age two. He has a retired seizure alert dog and, uh, named Bridget and will be receiving his second service dog from Four Paws for Ability in January 2022. Hello and welcome to our discussion about service dogs, uh, specifically seizure assistance dogs, who in our community we commonly refer to as seizure dogs. My name is Erin Rioyo and I am very humbled to be here as the newest Gervais Foundation staff member, proudly serving as your family network support group liaison. I am joined by two other phenomenal women and mothers, Bethany Gehring and Morgan Turpin. My husband, Leo, and I live just outside of the Seattle area in Kenmore, Washington. We are very proud parents to our seven-year-old son, Leonel, who has Gervais syndrome, and our five-year-old daughter, Eloise, who is his VIP super sister. We received Leonel's service dog in, um, at the time of this recording, exactly um, two years ago tomorrow in, from Four Paws for Ability in Zinio, Ohio. His service dog's name is Alicia. She is a golden doodle who will turn four years old on New Year's Eve this year. Um, I'd like for you to meet Bethany, who will tell you a little bit about herself. Hi, my name is Bethany Gehring. Um, my daughter, Kylan, is 13 years old and has Gervais. Kylan's the one in yellow in this picture. Um, her twin sister, Taylor, is also 13. And then our son, Caleb, is uh, the little guy um, standing in front of Brad, and he's 12. Um, we got Kylan a service dog when she was six years old. We also went through Four Paws for Ability, and we've had London for seven years now. She's eight years old. And let me introduce you to London. London, sit. There we go. This is London. This is Kai's service dog. She's eight years old. London does not go to school with Kai. That was our choice. So she's home with us during the day. And then she's all excited when Kai comes home and works for Kai um, outside of school hours and sleeps with her all night long. Um, we've had a great time with London and she's getting close to retirement age. She's now had both legs um, with ACL replacements. So we are just restarting our um, fundraising and looking into replacing London. Um, and we're grateful that she'll stay with us through all of her retirement years, um, even when we get a new service dog. And Morgan, let's hear from you and your introduction. Hi, I'm Morgan Turpin. I um, 
live in the San Diego area with my husband, Sean, and our two kids, Shane and Taylor. Shane is nine and he has Dravet syndrome and Taylor, his super sister, is six. Shane received his service dog, Bridget, from Four Paws for Ability when he was five years old. Um, Shane also has autism, so Bridget is a multi-purpose service dog trained in seizure assistance and balance assistance and behavior disruption. And she retired very recently. Um, she retired early due to some health concerns. And in January of 2022, he will be receiving his second service dog also from Four Paws for Ability. So we're very excited to be able to have Bridget live out her retirement days in our home. She's been very special to us. And we're also excited to meet his new service dog. We do have some disclosures. As you've heard from each of our families, all three of our families have um, completed training and we maintain certification with Four Paws for Ability, which is based out of Ohio. During each of our trainings, we worked with then director of training, Jeremy Dolabon, who is the now owner, um, full-time owner and director of Dolabon Dog Training in Ohio. And there are also many families in our Gervais community who have had service dogs from both Four Paws for Ability. They've had training from Jeremy or they have received service dogs from CARES, which is based in Kansas. We state all this because as an organization, Gervais Syndrome Foundation will not make recommendations about service dogs or related organizations, but DSF will honor um, and highlight stories and experiences within our Gervais community so that we can assist uh, with the decision about whether to and from where to pursue a service dog for the Gervais patient. Um, and you will hear a lot about what goes into um, selecting an organization from Bethany. Moving on, we want to talk about what is a service dog. You will hear um, the term service dog. You may hear us talk about seizure dogs. And often in their uh, public and community, people uh, don't have a full understanding of the difference between service dogs, therapy dogs, or emotional support animals. This link here is provided from Four Paws for Ability, and it just outlines um, a really nice visual for talking about what service dogs are. Um, what you should know is service dogs are protected by the American with Americans with Disabilities Act, and service dogs provide a specific service for a child or um, an individual with a disability. They perform specific tasks. Because they're protected by ADA, they are allowed to be in public locations. Those with therapy dogs or emotional support dogs do not have full public access. Therapy dogs can have access with permission by uh, the specific location, such as libraries, hospitals, um, schools. And therapy dogs are encouraged to be there for all individuals in the vicinity, whether it's a Reading with Rover is a popular one, um, taking therapy dogs to hospitals. But again, those are encouraged, uh, those dogs are encouraged to participate with all individuals, um, regardless of skills. Emotional support animals are an animal, is an animal that is assigned directly to an individual simply for the emotional support. They do not have public access rights, but they do are protected by housing laws. There is, um, there is more information that you can access both from Four Paws for Ability, but also um, by looking up in service dogs, uh, looking up information about service dogs. And although we've said um, seizure assistance dogs several times, you heard Morgan mention uh, an autism assistance dog. There are also diabetic alert dogs. Um, assistant dogs for um, patients with fetal alcohol syndrome facilitated guide dogs, hearing ear dogs, mobility assistance dogs. You heard Morgan mention multi-purpose assistance dogs when you're wrapping a lot of those categories into one and then seizure assistance dogs. And from Four Paws for Ability, they state there are two types of dogs trained to help with seizure disorders, seizure response dogs and seizure alert dogs. 
for pause training falls into the second category and they refer to them as seizure assistance dogs, which is why you'll hear the three of us refer to our dogs as seizure assistance dogs. Bethany's gonna give us some information um, about how you even get started with making the decision to move forward with um, pursuing a service dog. Um, we, when we first got London, uh, the, that was the most exciting part of getting a service dog, but so much went into that prior to London becoming part of our family. Um, one of the biggest things I want you to come away with from this is that you and your family need to do their own research, do their own, make their own choices um, and decide what works best for you. Um, what works best for one family might not be the perfect fit for your family. Um, so make sure that you are really doing your research and looking into it. Every company that trains service dogs has different um, options for you um, and they work a little bit differently. They raise funds a little bit differently. Um, and it's really important that you vet out everyone that you hear from, make sure that they are a good company, a company that's going to stick with you um, as your dog gets older um, and that you have someone to turn to because the dog does not come as a robot and is not going to be perfect every single day. Um, just like your child, you need, to, they will go through training. They should know what to do, but you need to continue doing that training um, all along. So it's important to have a um, organization behind you that's going to support you and help you with your questions. Um, if needed, be able to send your dog back for additional training or come out to you for training. Um, but the other thing is a family might have a great experience with an organization and another family might have a horrible experience with the same organization. So make sure you're looking into it and see what's gonna work best for you. Um, some of the different things to look at are financial ways. Um, some organizations, you do all the fundraising by yourself or not even, and the fundraising can only be done if it's a nonprofit for the most part, unless you're gonna do fundraising and let people know this isn't a tax write-off, this is just for my um, child to get their service dog. Um, you can just pay out of your own personal payments. Some people take out personal loans to pay for their dogs, um, but it is a big financial um, choice for your family to make. There are some organizations that you don't pay and the, your, the dog is given to you. Um, my, tip, my experience with that is that there's long waiting periods for those and um, it is hard to find those for um, children who can't handle their own dog. Um, the other thing to take into consideration for financial wise is your traveling expenses, because that is another um, big financial choice for your family to make and deciding where you're going to get your dog from, how far you're going to need to travel. Um, when you look into training, the different organizations that you can do are you can go travel to the organization. They train your dog for a year or two, and then you go out and you learn about how to handle your dog. Um, who's already fully trained by the time you meet them. This is how Four Paws um, does their dog training. They train your dog for that time. You come out, you go see them for two weeks, um, get to know them, they get to know you, and you pass your um, exam at the end to show that you are able to handle your dog safely in public. Um, and they call that a public access test. Um, there's other, or there's other usually smaller groups that they will um, come and train your puppy for you. And you would, you can have that puppy from the first time. Um, there are benefits to this. Some people say that when they have a puppy from the very beginning, their dog knows their child a lot better because they grew up um, knowing the child and can sense seizures and sense when things are wrong more often. However, the, it's also hard because that puppy might not be a great public service dog. So they might be a good dog for your child in the home but you don't know until that dog gets older and starts having to access public. Are they nervous when they're out there? Are they going to listen to you out there in the public? Um, and now you're attached to a puppy and the puppy is attached to your child and you can't actually take this dog out in public because it's not a safe, um, it's not safe for you or your family to have that dog out there. However, there are people that have puppies they've brought up, they've had an awesome trainer and they have great service dogs in the end. So it's up to what risk you want to take when it comes to, having a puppy in your house to start um, and just assuming that they're going to make a great uh, service dog. Uh, and then there's 
bunches of different types of dogs. And um, Aaron had brought that up a little bit. There's multiple large breeds dogs that are used. Um, and you can have poodles, golden retrievers, um, golden doodles, you know, pretty much under the sun. It has more to do with the dog's disposition um, and how they handle stressful, loud public situations. And can they pay attention to your child while they're out um, in public and be working, not distracted during that time. Um, there's also small dogs. If your child only needs a dog for seizure alert, a small dog might be what they want and that might, they might be afraid of big dogs. So there are organizations that have small dogs. Different things dogs do, which we went into a little bit, are seizure alert versus seizure response. Um, so a seizure alert dog would be a dog that can possibly tell prior to a seizure starting and would say something's different with my kid, pay attention to them for the next couple hours or the next couple of days. Um, other dogs are seizure alert or seizure response dogs. So they will typically bark or come find an adult when um, their child is having a seizure. Um, London does seizure response. Um, she does not alert to Kai Pre. Um, she was trained for seizure alert um, prior to us getting her. However, when we went out to get her, Kai decided that she wasn't going to seize for the next five years. So we call London the best service dog ever. Um, she did not start seizing again until we changed up meds so that she could start developing more um, because she was pretty snowed and becoming more delayed um, on her current meds um, or on her old meds. So we changed to newer meds. We have more seizures, but we also have a lot more development and we are working with London to retrain her. And as I said, it's important to have an organization that's going to follow and keep teaching you things. Um, Cause as of now, we still talk to four paws on how do we retrain something that we let London lose because we didn't use it at all. Um, London also does search and rescue for Kai. So when she wanders away, she can find her. It's actually Kai and London's favorite game in the whole world. They think it's hide and go seek. Um, and so they both really, really enjoy it. Um, behavior disruption is one that we use every day. Even when Kai wasn't seizing, London was such an important part of our life. She kept Kai calm. We were able to go out in public. Kai has a twin sister and a brother a year younger. When Kai wasn't able to handle things, the other two kids weren't able to go do things in public. And that was really hard, especially at the young age in elementary school where there's so many fun public things to do with them. Um, and we would have to leave 10, 15 minutes into an event and they knew, oh, Kai can't handle this. We need to go home but they were giving something up for her. With London, we were able to handle full days at fairs, full days um, in museums, in you know, fun little things like that, that she never would have done before because she's able to just ground herself with her dog, get away, and the other two can enjoy, herself, enjoy themselves. Um, we also do tethering with London, especially when Kai was younger, um, where London has her harness and it has a basically bungee cord between the two of them. Um, and we are holding London. Um, and that's another option to look at. It keeps Kai from running away, but still gives her the um, option to have freedom and not have to be held by a human being at all times. Um, to think about in the end of things that you're, when you're going through your thoughts on if you want a dog or not, remember it's a big commitment. This is another child in your house or another household member. Um, when I pack for vacation, I need to pack for the dog. When we fly on the plane, she gets her own luggage. She has her own medication she takes monthly. She has to be cleaned up after she needs to be groomed. We keep her extra clean so that if Kai is emergently in the hospital, she's still clean enough to have in there. Um, it's a money, um, it's a financial burden on the family even after you finish your fundraising and have the dog. Um, because they're a service dog and working, they need to have high quality food. They need to be fed more amounts of food because they're out walking every day. They're not a lazy dog who lays in the house all day long. Um, and you want to make sure that you're keeping up on their grooming, on their nails, on everything, because you want this dog to last as long as possible. They're your child's best friend and they're keeping your child safe. Um, and overall, you need to do what works best for your family. Um, and remember that everybody's family is a little bit different. So find out what your family wants, what commitment your family's willing to make, um, and talk to other families so you can really learn what the experiences are like. Erin and Morgan, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that at all? 
I am really glad you brought up the tethering and the search and rescue because I know that um, the many families in our um, community do have children who elope. And that is another really incredible service um, that a dog can provide. Um, we also, you mentioned some of those things and Morgan also the, the, the balance and the mobility and just being able to have that access out in public is really important. In addition, when you talk about the expenses, um, I know the joke in our community is, you know, who has time for self-care? Um, the dog is far, gets far more spa days than I do. Um, and it, and it does come at an expense. Um, their expenses not being one of the disclosures I should have added. I'm not actually a dog person. I am this dog's person, but I didn't grow up with dogs. I didn't, um, we didn't own a dog prior. So I didn't really have a full understanding of the cost with eating, the cost with groomings. Um, and I am, we are feeling that now and, and really having that extra expense. And also pet insurance. I will talk mm. about that in a little bit, but that's been an expense, but one that we're very grateful to have. <laughs> yes, Excellent. I agree. So Bethany has told you how to get started and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what to expect. Um, when you are in that uh, training process. Again, we, um, the three of us have all gone through four paws. Um, they have changed their procedures a little bit, um, mostly derived out of the necessity given the pandemic. Um, but at the time of our trainings, we all participated in a 12 day, essentially 60 hour training um, to learning basic obedience, learning the commands, learning grooming, um, a very intensive training program um, to really learn how to take care of this dog that really they are, they are trusting us to be able to take this dog and go. We took our entire family. So aside from the expense of it, it was a large time commitment. We traveled from the Seattle area, Seattle, Washington to Ohio. Um, other organizations, you could be traveling to Kansas. Four Pods does have a new location in Alaska, in Anchorage. But keep in mind, you may be traveling for this and not just traveling for a weekend, but two solid weeks of training. Our whole family went and um, took a, we kind of lovingly recall, uh, refer to it as medical tourism. So it, it came in under that category, but we did a very intensive training where we were really learning how to take care of this dog. Um, that doesn't stop after the training. You come home and you continue to um, work on these skills every single day, because if you're not working on those skills, the, like Beth Bethany said, the dog is not a robot. They can lose these skills. Um, Leonel also decided at the time of training to stop having as many seizures. So um, one thing we can, again, we're very thankful and very grateful for that. Um, but one skill that she was trained for that we no longer use, she um, was used to be able to get his med, med, we called it med bag, and she would be able to um, retrieve his medicine bag with his rescue medicine. Um, thankfully, he's been rescue med free for nearly four years. So we are not using that command anymore. Um, thankfully, we can go back to the organization and if he started having more seizures and we needed to get that med bag um, back into the training, we could use them to do that. But again, it's going to take a lot of practice on our part, um, continuing to take her out in public so that she doesn't lose those skills. Right now, I am in the thick of getting her transition to school. Um, our organization requires that you um, have a, it's not just the child and the service dog, but it's a three um, member team. It's the child, the service dog, and the handler. So I myself am the handler. My husband is the handler. Um, in some cases, um, the child can pass um, certification with four paws to be the handler. I don't know if there's any families in our Gervais community where this is the case, but the, we did have um, families in our classes that did that. So I am training my sons one-on-one. -on -one. 
my son already had a one-on-one -on -one prior to getting the service dog. And once we knew we were getting the service dog and talked to the principal, we had an incredibly supportive um, team that said, yes, let's bring that dog here. Yes, let's get your one-on-one um, -on -one trained to be the handler. That is not always going to be the case. Unfortunately, there's many stories where they're not as supportive of teams. Um, they may not understand the full need of having a service dog on site. Know that in your community and with the organization that you're working with, there are many people that can help you navigate that process. Um, but it's not as simple as a couple of training sessions. I am putting in um, at minimum 60 hours on site at school to train the one-on-one. -on -one. And what that looks like right now is I go to school with them. I stay in class with them. I'm teaching um, on the job, so to speak. And then thankfully our organization has also provided other materials for our one-on-one -on -one to review on its own, some videos, some of the th same things that parents have access to, but so that he can further his learning. But also just, you know, the feeling that when you're sending your child off to school, you trust that someone knows how to handle them. Think about now, there's very few who know how to handle this service dog. So you really want to make sure that you have the support of your organization and that you're taking the time to truly train a new handler. Um, we talk about as, as parents, you know, finding that, that alone time and it doesn't always happen. The same is true when you have a service dog. Every um, errand, even if your children are at school and the dog's not at school yet, every errand is a training opportunity. So we're taking the dog to the grocery store, um, understanding that they could refuse us service because that service dog is not trained for my disability, but we thankfully live in a community that is very supportive of making sure that they understand we are continuing to train this dog and making sure they can maintain their skills. Something that's been a little bit difficult for all of our families for the, the past two years of this pandemic. Um, having the dog at school is another expense. You are, um, adding a crate to school, um, a, a couple of additional things there so they have it. Um, I right now am going to be ordering a crate and supplies for the dog to have at school and because that's not just something we could bring back and forth every single day. So again, things that you really want to consider, you heard Bethany say it was their choice not to have the dog at school. Your child right now might not even be close to school age. Um, I know that in our Gervais community, children are getting a diagnosis much younger, and you may start pursuing a service dog before your child is even one years old, so you're not even sure what it might look like at three years old. But if you are looking to take the dog to school, there is a lot that goes into that decision as well. Bethany mentioned um, that um, London is not alerting or, in a sense, predicting seizures right now. During a training session, Alicia can respond to seizures that are either faked by Leonel or faked by me for the training purposes, but all of his seizures are nocturnal. So when he has his seizures, um, thanks to the treatments that he has been able to be on, um, he's not seizure free, but his seizures are much shorter and less severe. So by the time the seizure is, has started, it's almost finished. And she's kind of off the job. She's sleeping. So right now she's not even responding to the actual seizures. But when we put it in a training situation, she does. We knew getting the dog, there would be no guarantees. We did our very best with um, going through the whole training process and teaching about uh, teaching her how to respond to the seizures, and we continue to do that. Um, but it is a, an emotional and kind of taxing thing to think you are getting a dog and you really want the seizure assistance dog, but there's other benefits to that as well. And so I think that you really need to think about beyond it, her being a service, a seizure assistance dog. We are so grateful the fact 
that you can see here in one of the photos, she is a, she helps with balance and she helps with mobility. Lionel is active. He is a walker and a runner, but we can see um, what Gervais is starting to do to his body. And he is a slow walker and he does sometimes shuffle along. He doesn't quite have the gait issues, but we don't know what that might look like in another year. So mobility assistance was a big thing for us, as well as behavior disruptions. He can go from being agreeable and calm to wants to scream and throw something. And so it's really important that we keep Alicia trained to help him um, move beyond that behavior and kind of have a calm moment. moment. Bethany Morgan, is there anything that you would like to add to what it's like once you bring the dog home? I just wanted to add that since you both touched on it, we had a similar experience with seizure alerting being a lot different than what we expected. Um, Shane's seizures are also primarily during sleep, although he does have some during the day. And we kind of expected that he might be able to eventually sleep in his own room with his service dog that they would alert at night. And that's just not the reality. He, ha he still has so many on a nightly basis. And as Aaron mentioned, she's sleeping at night. So her nighttime alerts were inconsistent, but we also decided that it didn't make a lot of sense for us to focus a lot of energy on having her alert us when he already sleeps next to us because he needs attending to a lot anyways. So we decided instead to focus on her daytime alerting because his daytime seizures are a lot more rare. So she does do a bark alert and having her be reliable at bark alerting to daytime seizures has actually been very beneficial because it allows us to give him a little bit more freedom um, when he's in the house, like he can go into another room. She, they're very bonded. So she follows right after him. And the only time she ever barks is for seizures. So sure enough, if we hear her bark, we always go running because we know that it means trouble. So even though it looked different than what we thought it would, we've still find found a way to adjust the sales and make it work for us. Um, for us, when we got London, I think we were also, even though we were su surprised, I wouldn't say surprised, even though Kai wasn't seizing. So we didn't need the seizure response and alert part of London to start. There were so many things we didn't expect that happened. Also, Kai was fairly nonverbal when we got London. Um, and she started scripting what we told people when we got London, this is my service dog, London. We made people talk to Kai about it. Well, Kai now will go tell everybody, this is London. She gave London a new a middle name. It's London Rose. She will yell at everybody if you don't call her London Rose. The amount of speech that has come out of this child since we've had a dog is amazing. Um, and it's something that when we asked for calls about it, they said they have a lot of parents that tell them things like this. Um, whether it's just that the child's now calm and able to settle down while their dog's with them and they can take the time for those words to come from their brain out their mouth. Um, I don't know what it is, but it was an amazing difference for us that we noticed within a month or two of having London that we never expected. Um, her behavior changed just from having the dog around. We thought the dog was going to help with her having meltdowns, but instead she was able to handle situations that she never would be able to handle before um, because of having London. So we could do more things and London didn't need to disrupt her as much. London just needed to be there with her. Um, so there's a lot of positives that you get unexpectedly also, not just negatives that come unexpectedly. I think that's an incredible segue into Morgan sharing with us, um, expecting the unexpected which are some good unexpecteds and some not so wonderful unexpecteds. Go ahead and share with us, Morgan. Thanks, Erin. So yes, I wanted to touch on the point that there's gonna be some things that you can expect going into it as Erin um, and Bethany both mentioned, but then there's also gonna be some things that happen that you might not expect to happen. And as has already been mentioned, just understanding that it is a lot of work. And I think that we underestimated that a little bit when we first brought the service dog back to the hotel with us when we were in training. It felt very similar to bringing home a newborn. Like, okay, they're trusting us to take this dog and to know what we're doing. <laughs> and it was a little bit surprising. And we had some um, 
hiccups in the beginning and that's totally to be expected. So just understanding that as it was mentioned earlier, they're not robots, they're living beings and, um, the age of the dog depends on the organization, but they tend to be towards the younger end, um, or obviously if you get a puppy, so they are younger and, you know, things happen and you just have to understand that you're not going to bring this dog home and it's going to fall perfectly in line. There is going to be some adjustment. And I think that communication with the organization that you go with is so important. We um, had several things come up in the beginning after we brought her home and we had to reach out to them constantly and they worked with us really well over email, phone, et cetera. Um, we sent them videos just to show them what was going on and they were able to help us work through it and just to reinforce the training to get through these issues. And it was also mentioned, sometimes the dog goes back for training. That's another option. I know that there's an emotional toll that comes along with that because you wait so long and you finally get the dog home and then you realize there are some things that need to be worked on and the dog needs to return back to the training center. And that can be really hard, but um, it is, you know, an option, just something to consider that can come up. Um, as Bethany was talking about knowing that when you are taking this dog with you, it's like having another child. You have to, in addition to making sure your child with Gervais, that you have the rescue bag and the medical equipment and the stroller and the cooling vest, et cetera. You also have to make sure that you have the dog's equipment and the treat bag and the potty bags and, you know, whatever that you need supplies for the dog. And sometimes, as we know, um, we have a lot of unexpected trips and Bridget has accompanied Shane to every ER visit, every hospital stay, doctor's appointments, et cetera. So we sort of have a go bag for her as well. And we keep extra supplies in his rescue bag that's always with him so that we are prepared. And we learned what to put in it the hard way <laughs> for some things, you know, you just it's life, things happen, you have a living being out in public and just understanding that it's okay and rolling with it and learning how to adapt. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that the needs can change from the time that you apply. So Shane was about three and a half when we started the process and he had not been diagnosed with autism yet. And um, his mobility was a lot different when he was three and a half than even when he was five, when we actually brought her home. And now that he's nine and we're going into the process for getting his second dog, things are even different than they were before. And one of the things that Bridget was trained for is balance assistance. Well, the way that it worked, we ended up just not using it because most of the time that we're out in public, he's in his stroller, like one of the pictures there and she heals next to the stroller. So balance assistance for us just wasn't something that we really needed. So the second time around, we're swapping that out and we're doing more mobility assistance where the dog will be able to actually retrieve items for him or for us, because at this point in our lives, that's more useful. So just understanding that their needs do change over time and um, having continuous communication with the service dog organization while you're in that waiting period is important because if something major comes up, you want to communicate it to them as soon as possible. If it might change the direction of the dog's training and knowing that that's an option, I think is good too. You don't have to, when you fill out that initial application, it's not set in stone. It should be a fluid process throughout the wait. Um, I also want to mention that dogs can have potential health issues that come up and sometimes when they're younger. So Bridget developed epilepsy in the irony of life. Um, she now is also on anti-seizure medication in addition to her boy. And um, unfortunately, as we all know, epilepsy is very unpredictable. So it became something where we didn't feel comfortable continuing to have her work as a service dog and um, our organization agreed with us. And also she experiences side effects from the medication that she's on and it makes it a lot more difficult for her to do her job. So we did have to make the hard decision to retire her early. Um, we never anticipated on returning in just a few years after getting the service dog to get another one. 
But one of the things that was really important to us when we were vetting our organization was we wanted someone that really stands behind their dogs. And that was one of the things that we had seen with Four Paws, the organization that we went with. And because unexpected things come up, we wanted to know that there was someone who would be able to work with us. And, um, you know, life is crazy and we found ourselves in the position of actually needing to utilize that. But we're thankful that we're able to pursue getting a replacement dog for him because he truly loves having her there. And part of the reason why it's so essential for us to have a dog that can go everywhere with us is one of our unexpected positives. So we knew that Bridget was going to be trained in seizure alert and autism assistance and balance. But one of the big issues that we struggled with for years before we got her was at nighttime was sleeping due to autism and due to frequent nocturnal seizures. Shane developed a fear of falling asleep and it made it really difficult for him every single night Um, he had to have someone with him in order to fall asleep. And this process could take hours. And at the time, my husband got up really early in the morning and was gone really long hours. So the time that we had in the evening was very short and we had to spend most of the time with one of us in the room trying to help him fall asleep. So it was a stressful time. And after we brought Bridget home, we were lucky that they bonded very quickly and it was a couple months after we had her there one night, I, she always slept in bed with him. And I just said, okay, I'm going to go and she's going to be your person now. And I left the room and I fully expected, you know, that's not going to last. We're going to have screaming. He's going to be getting out of bed coming after we anxiously watched the monitor and he didn't do that. He just laid there. And about 10 minutes later, he was asleep and it was really, really incredible to see that and um, makes me almost a little bit emotional (laughs) and something that we absolutely didn't expect to happen, but it's actually turned out to be one of the biggest changes I would say to our lives that this dog has brought. And that is why it's so important to have a dog that can go everywhere with us because we do travel as a family. Bridget's been on planes, trains, a cruise ship. Um, She's been on multiple vacations, trips to Disneyland. And especially when we have an overnight, we're not always able to stay at a place that would be pet friendly in order to bring her. And we wouldn't be able to leave her in the room all day. So we need a service dog who would be um, granted public access to be able to be there with us to perform that essential nighttime duty. Um, did you guys have something, Erin and Bethany, that you wanted to add about unexpected? One thing I want to add uh, that's been really in, uh, a big impact on us is not just knowing how different your child might be over those um, years, but the sibling side of it. Um, maybe you're done growing your family. Maybe you are having more children later Um one of the hardest things for us has been trying to protect the bond because the sibling is wants the dog too. Um, so that has been something that we've honestly struggled with a lot. Um, really having to direct Leonel's sister, please stop touching her. Please stop distracting her. Um, we are on the list on a waiting list to get her, um, her own companion dog. Um, whether we go through an ESA route for that, for a dog that won't have public access. Um, I had mentioned that we're not really, a. a I'm not really a dog person. I'm not interested in raising a puppy (laughs) on top of everything that we already go through. So I um, am really grateful for an organization that allows you access to adopt dogs that don't go on to be service dogs. Um, But that was something that I hadn't really thought about. Um, We got the dog when his sister was three and now she's five and we keep waiting for there to, to be a disconnect or some disinterest, but it is something that we're continually having to train them as well. And um, at our training, 
they drill into you, protect the bond, protect the bond, protect the bond. Because if the dog is not bonded to the child, then you're not really able to access those services that the dog can provide. Um, I would put that under expecting the unexpected. She's um, very loving The my daughter is very loving to her and loves her, but she gets so kind of stuck on her. And that has been a really challenging thing for us. And you might not know that about your own children and, and what their personalities are, depending on where you are in the process. Um, I will just also add in those, those health issues that Morgan spoke about and Bethany spoke about with um, London having a couple of surgeries. Um, tomorrow, Alicia is scheduled for an echocardiogram. There is nothing that we believe to be an issue, but when she um, was in her program, they did some standard procedures and they did notice a very mild thing. So it's just something we're following up with. Again, just thinking about those added expenses, um, grateful for pet insurance and grateful for a really great um, health care, uh, veterinarian care that we have out here. Bethany, what else did you have to add to that? Um, I think the only thing I, I thought of um, talking about London um, retiring and the things that she does for Kai now, um, it will be an interesting thing to have the next service dog come in. But London's so bonded to Kai that Kai will still, London will always be working even as a retired dog. And these service dogs love what they do. Um, so she may not be the dog that we take out in public areas and takes care of Kai when we're out and about. But when we come home, that little tail will still be wagging away when Kai walks in the door and she will be so excited. Um, and she will be right up against her because you know that's what she loves to do. And when she's not working, she's bored. Um, when I introduced her earlier, I put her vest on her and she thought right away that Kai was coming home from school early and she was at that door ready, ready for Kai to come home. She's kind of moping now because she has her vest on and she's not working. So um, she will be very eager when Kai gets home um, in the next little while, because she thinks that it's happening already. But that's what she loves to do. She loves to work and she loves to take care of her girl. And she knows that's what makes me happiest. So um, that's never going to go away, even as she retires. Um, before we open up for questions or comments, um, I do want to go to our last slide. And one of the final um, expecting the unexpected is uh both the social skill, the social piece that we tapped into, but also the connection that your child will have to that dog and the connection you may have to other families. I know that we were, we're not in these pictures here, but our family had another Gervais family at our training and we will be forever bonded to that family. And, and that little girl and her dog are pictured here. I know two families who went to um, their CARES training during the pandemic, um, uh, both in our Gervais community and they are forever bonded. You see them pictured here with their families and their dogs and the children. All of these pictures are used with permission and they're forever bonded by just going through this same process together. We've recently had um, a family move to our area and our dogs actually um, are related. And so you'll see um, the dogs pictured there um, before one of our walks where we got to get together. So you aren't alone in this process. Even if you don't go to a training class with another family, you are, um, there's lots of, lots of, lots of families in our community, um, no matter where they've gone to, who have gone through this process and are there for um, your support and to help you answer questions along the way. At this time, we will open it up for any questions or comments, but we do just want to thank you for your time. And we hope this helps you with your decision about whether or not to pursue a service dog. That was so helpful. Thank you all for sharing your experiences with us today. Um, we do have several questions, so I'm just going to go ahead and read those off, and then I'll let the panel members decide which ones they feel that they would have uh, a good response to. So our first one was, how much does a seizure dog cost? 
I can take that one. We um, learned from our organization the cost of even raising a dog is close to forty to sixty thousand um, dollars. That is not the cost that we paid by any means. But when you are starting from breeding through raising through training your dog, um, the costs are incredibly high. You are going to see a variety of prices through different organizations or different trainers, and you can expect um, maybe some might be free to you to bring home, um, but others run closer to about $20,000. Again, this is just a question that you're going to want to ask and look into to each of the different organizations. And really this next question ties into that is, you know, how do you raise that much money? I think a lot of our families feel stressed and overwhelmed already. And so they also asked, are there any grants available or charities that can help with funding? For grants and charities, you'll want to check um, more at your local level. Um, there are some different fraternal organizations that may help out. Um, I have heard of families getting grants from the Chelsea Hutchinson Foundation. Um, and at one point, there were families going through Make-A-Wish, but I don't believe that that is in effect anymore. We were very pleasantly surprised when we joined the Four Paws Network. So many families had incredibly creative um, fundraising ideas. We were so um, appreciative of people in our community, just people wanted to help. People wanted to step up and run fundraisers for us, donate silent auction items, send us just money just to, to contribute to the fund so that we could turn that into four paws. I've heard of many families being very successful with um, shoe fundraisers. We had a, I'm very into themes. So we had a pizza party um, and we had donated pizzas. We had a silent auction and we just, again, this is pre COVID, um, but we had many um, contributions just from our family, our friends and, and friends of friends because people are really, um, there's so many dog lovers out there. And so you'll be very pleasantly to, surprised to see um, people donating from their businesses to contribute. I think that's such a great point. And we hear that a lot that, you know, friends and family will sometimes reach out to DSF and say, how can I help, you know, the person that I love who's dealing with this. And I think, just like you said, you're pleasantly surprised when you do something like this, how much support you get behind you. Um, for the next question, is there anything you would have done differently when getting your dog? For instance, do you think your child was too young and you wish you would have waited until they were older? I can take that one also. Uh, just like everything in our Gervais life in our community, it, hindsight is so 2020. Um, just like with new meds. Should we have started at that age? Should we have done things differently? I know for our family, there is not much we would have changed at the time. I think we regretted not applying earlier, but the way that the dog came into our family at the age of my son being in his kindergarten year was really just quite perfect. I've heard of families getting their dogs much younger and that really worked out for them. And I've heard of other families um, really finding that their best time was waiting until their child was a little bit older and could have a little bit more um, understanding of the situation. As far as doing something differently, I don't think that there's much that I could look at uh, as doing differently. Bethany, Morgan, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, we're about to go through it again. And I besides the unforeseen things that happen, I wouldn't have changed anything. Shane was also five when we brought Bridget home. And as you said, for us, that situation worked out really well. Um, they bonded very quickly and it was a little tough because we also had a two-year-old at home. So um, that was just something that we had to get through. It was like, you know, having two young family members with the new dog and with a toddler as well. But um, I, I think, you know, everything in hindsight, everything worked out the way it was supposed to. So there's not much that I would change. Let's see, the next question from a parent was, can you have other pets in your household when you have a seizure assistance dog? I can take oh. No, oh. go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so different organizations have different rules. 
Um, so definitely um, you need to look into what those rules are. Um, Four Paws, where we got our dog from, um, allows you to have other pets. There are restrictions around the timing of getting new pets, just so that you're not raising uh, two new family members at the same time and that you're able to have good bonding between the dog and um, who they're taking care of. Um, and it's also one of those things that you want to make sure you're telling and being open and honest to whoever is training your new dog. Because if you have, you know, maybe it's not another dog in the house, but maybe you have a guinea pig or chickens, you want to make sure that your service dog is able to tolerate those and not chasing your chickens around the yard when they're supposed to be working. Um, so it's something to be open and honest about, but also make sure that whoever's training your dog um, allows that. This next question that just came in is, is there any allergy free service dog? And I guess I would just add to that question. If so, are there certain things that you think people should ask organizations when they're first starting this journey in order to make sure they have a dog that their child won't be allergic to? I can answer this one. Um, so we do not have, we have a um, golden retriever. So ours is not a allergen free. Um, there are organizations that have like poodles that they'll raise or other curly hair dogs. Four Paws does have um, golden doodles and um, other doodles that they have. Um, they do require that you show a um, positive allergy test in order to guarantee that that's the type of dog you're going to get. Um, and they still have some allergens, but um, they're less, I guess they're hypoallergenic. So um, different organizations will tell you what kind of dogs they have. So you just have to look into that. And um, adding on to that, we do have a golden doodle um, specifically because um, not my child with the dog, but his sister, she had sensitive skin as a baby. And we did do um, allergy testing on all of us just to check. And she was confirmed to have a mild cat and dog allergy. And so that was the confirmation we needed to submit um, for a golden, golden doodle or a poodle. Great. Um, this parent said, <clears throat> excuse me, my son hasn't bonded with any of our current pets. How can we be sure to get him to bond if we do get a seizure assistance dog? I can take this one. So we had this experience. We had a dog that we've had since my husband and I were together before we had kids. And um, I was a little concerned about this because Shane, besides throwing the tennis ball for him in the backyard, he really didn't show any outward affection towards him. Um, he didn't really try and pet him or, you know, be close to him. He was kind of just a presence in his life that he rarely acknowledged. So I wasn't sure what that was going to mean when we brought the service dog home. But in our experience, we just explained a lot about the dog. And I showed him a lot of pictures of kids with dogs. And he started coining the phrase doggy in my lap as like a explanation of the type of dog that he was going to get. And the very first day that we met her, he laid on her and he's been like physically attached to her ever since. So I do think there's something that is a lot different with these service dogs than with just, just your general pet, at least in our experience, that's definitely how it went. And I think preparing your child and showing them examples and talking to them about it, even if you're not sure if they even understand, he was uh, less than five when we were going through the weight process. So we weren't really sure how much he was absorbing, but clearly once we got there, we realized, okay, he was definitely understanding and they, we've been very fortunate. They've had a great bond. And also your uh, service dog organization, part of the training is that they prepare you for how to encourage the bond. So they will give you lots of tips and tricks for things that you can do and it's a continual conversation that you have with the trainers back and forth for ways that you can help enhance the bond. It's not always something that happens overnight. So um, sometimes it just takes a lot of work. That's good to know though that they offer those tips to help you through that process. Um, our next question was, have you ever had a problem with the dog not being allowed into a public place? We've run into um, some small problems. Um, the most obvious one was we went into a restaurant in the middle of nowhere. It was like a Burger King or something as a family stopping on during a trip. 
And they came up to our table and were like, you're not allowed to have dogs here. And we're like, oh, she's a service dog. It doesn't matter. You can't have dogs here. Um, so we had to just educate them is the way we go about it and let them know, hey, so she's here to work. She's been trained and our daughter has a disability. And they're really the questions they're allowed to ask is, do you, is your dog trained for a disability that you have? Yes, yes, yes. Um, and our organization gives us cards um, that have the dog's name on it and that they are service dog trained by the organization um, and that they are allowed in public places. Um, we also carry cards for Kai that have the ADA rules written on them so that we can just educate as we go and let them know they can't kick us out. Um, we also have had like hotels that tell us that, oh, we don't allow dogs and we just, everywhere we've gone besides that one place has just been, oh, she's a service dog, here's her ID and they let us go. So a lot of places will ask or look at our vest and be like, oh, she's a service dog and London so well behaved that it's not questioned after we educate them on it. I love that they gave you those cards too. That has to make it much easier that you have something you can hand off right away. That's great. Right. Um, and our last question is actually directed to Morgan and they were just curious, did you have to raise funds for the replacement dog? Yes, yeah, so we did not um, since she is a replacement due to a unforeseen medical situation that arose. She's having to retire years beyond uh, the typical time that service dogs retire. So uh, we had very good communication with the organization as her condition evolved. And we came to a mutual decision that it would be in his best interest to get a replacement dog. So we will go and get her. We did not have to fundraise since it's not a situation where she's retiring due to age um, and we're just pursuing a second dog. That's good, good. I was that was Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say our situation is different and we're getting Kai's next dog, but London will be about 10 years old, which is about the age of retirement. And we do um, redo our fundraising um, through our, through um, Fort Balls. It is a contracted lesser rate for your second dog. Um, it all depends on what your original contract was through them. Um, but we will be redoing our fundraising for her because we've had her for what we had contracted and expected the dog to have the dog for. That's really good to know too. And it's nice to hear that they offer you a bit of a discount on the next dog, just knowing that at some point you will have to replace and get a new assistance animal. Wonderful, those are all of our questions that we had come in. So thank you again, Erin, Bethany, Morgan, we really appreciate you sharing your experiences.